This week we're going to be looking at chapter 16, which brings up the topics of evolution and evidence for evolution. I'll also be discussing a bit of the history of evolution. We start off in our chapter with an introduction looking at what geologists look at, the layers of the earth, which provide clues as to what happened in earth's past. The different layers are laid down each year and and show or give us kind of a map of what went on in Earth. Um, some of the interesting things that happen besides being in the rock layers but also leaving big huge critters behind were some asteroid impacts. Also the fact that we see certain species of fossils in the rock layer before that happened and then those species not showing up after that suggest mass extinctions occurred as well such as the one at 65.5 million years ago. A mass extinction is when we lose many species from the earth. The KT boundary layer is the one, the uh, layer of the earth that occurred 65.5 million years ago and is thought to be left over from when the big asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Below that layer we find dinosaur fossils quite numerous but after that layer they become pretty sparse. The coincidence the book asks us? Well probably not. Most scientists say no and from the evidence that they infer that an asteroid that was about 12 miles long actually did hit the earth and caused kind of a global catastrophe at the time which brought the ending of the reign of the dinosaurs. When we hear the word evolution we usually think of one person that person is Charles Darwin though he wasn't the first person to have ideas about that theory. Um, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, actually believed that organisms evolved. Um, and I've pulled up another slideshow here with some pictures on it. Uh, Lamarck, who actually lived before Darwin's time, believed that organisms changed, that they weren't just static, but uh, unlike what we know today, he believed that organisms could actually change in their own lifetime from the use of certain parts, that those parts could change due to using them, such as a giraffe who constantly stretched its neck into the trees to get food, would actually grow a longer neck and then be able to pass that longer neck onto their offspring and uh, those would be called acquired characteristics or acquired traits and today we know that that's actually not possible. It's actually populations of organisms that evolve, it's not the individuals. But again Lamarck lived before Darwin. And here's a picture of Darwin, who lived from 1809 to 1882. He was an English naturalist. He actually grew up having kind of a normal childhood, liking nature, liking animals. Uh, he didn't actually like school, though. Uh, his father sent him to medical school at first when he was old enough, but um, he actually left medical school after seeing a surgery on a boy without anesthetic. He just knew he couldn't handle that and didn't want any part of it. He tried the clergy for a while, but uh, that didn't work out. He actually became a naturalist and uh, today is famous for his ideas of evolution by natural selection. He actually didn't even call it evolution at the time. He used the phrase descent with modification. 
getting his ideas for natural selection actually took quite a while. Uh, if we go back to 1831 when he was 22 years old, he was elected to go on a five-year voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle, which would travel around the world and make many stops. And uh, he was elected to go upon this ship, not only to be the naturalist and collect samples, but to also be kind of a dinner companion with the captain. Back then, going on long journeys, you didn't, uh, if you were a captain of a ship, you didn't want to fraternize with your crew too much. You didn't want mutiny to happen. So you brought people with you whom you could socialize with to keep your status above your crew. So Charles Darwin was perfect for that role, uh, although uh, he did get seasick. Uh, a lot of the time on the ship, but he had his own little quarters and uh, was able to bring back many, many samples from all of the places that he stopped along the way. Here's a map of his trips. And they came down around Europe, down around Africa, Australia. His most famous stop was here though, right off the coast of South America, about uh, 500, 600 miles, and that's where you find the Galapagos Islands. Um, that actually wasn't the longest stop of the trip, it was actually pretty short, but it's kind of the place where we credit him being able to get all of his ideas for natural selection. The Galapagos Islands, since they're so isolated, they're volcanic islands right off the, south, the coast of South America, are kind of like a little um, isolated natural laboratory that uh, once those islands sprung up volcanically, they started getting populated with organisms that came from the mainland. Obviously, there'd be organisms that could swim there, that could fly there, but uh, organisms that were terrestrial arrived there by floating chunks of land and uh, that was known at the time and we'll talk more about those organisms. Now I'm going to back up for a second and uh, meanwhile, uh, going back to the history here, meanwhile while Charles Darwin was on this voyage observing many things from the geology of the different lands they traveled to, to the natives that lived within these lands, to even being able to see an earthquake in an area. There were other scientists that had already done or were doing some work at the time. Uh, for instance, a scientist or geologist named Cuvier came up with an idea called catastrophism. This was how he explained how changes in the earth actually happen, that those changes happen when catastrophes happen, for instance, like an earthquake or a volcano. James Hutton had his theory of gradualism, that changes in the earth are very slow. And then Lyell, who was probably one of the biggest influences on Darwin, actually wrote a book that Dar Darwin wrote, or excuse me, Darwin read while he was on the Beagle. Um, it was his book, The Principles of Geology. And his theory was called uniformitarianism, that change is uniform, that the changes that happened in the earth before are still happening now. And Darwin was able to read that book in between his bouts of seasickness while he was on the Beagle, which uh, gave him some great ideas, uh, especially when we think of evolution. It, it's not just biological, it's also the geology, the earth that changes as well and can act as also a driving force for species to change. going back to Darwin's voyage.
He saw many things from the native people to the earthquake, did a lot of geology studies along the way, and as kind of a young, naive guy, was just collecting everything he could collect. Specimens from everywhere he went, even dead specimens. He wondered a lot about what he saw. I was a good observationist. Wondered, such as, uh, why should extinct armadillo-like species and armadillos be found on the same continent? Saw a lot of fossils. Did a lot of uh, digging and a lot of unique species. And here's where we get to the actual Galapagos Islands. These are endemic species, species that don't exist anywhere else. One of the most famous um, are the finches that Darwin saw. Uh, he was amazed to see that there were so many varieties of, of finches on these islands, but yet on the mainland, of South America where these organisms came from there was only one species of finch. He uh, wrote in his book that these finches would kind of move around his feet. One of the unique things about the Galapagos animals is that they don't have too much of a fear of humans so you can get up close and personal with them. But while he was there he did collect uh, specimens of all the finches. He rode on the giant tortoises backs, saw the marine iguanas, and talked about how it was an ugly animal and really clumsy on land, but once it got into the water was just graceful as can be with swimming. And here's one of my favorites, the blue-footed boobies that have the pretty blue feet and do a, a kind of a neat little dance when they're doing their uh, mating rituals. But these are all very unique species. Well, he wondered, again, how did uh, one species of finch become so many different on the island? But uh, he wouldn't really figure that out until much later, because while he was on the trip, he just kind of took the specimens and didn't pay much attention to them and uh, just took them to take them back with him. Here's a neat slide showing the different finches and the beaks that all of them had. It's like each beak was a tool very well adapted to what they ate with different sizes. In fact, one of the finches even used this little needle-like thing here as a tool to dig out grubs. Darwin's conclusions that small populations of the original South American finch landed on the islands and that uh, over many generations the populations of the finches changed anatomically and behaviorally due to whatever uh, forces were acting upon them naturally, such as food sources, until the emergence of different species. And he asked himself, could a new species arise from an ancestral form by the gradual accumulation of adaptations? And that would be the beginnings of his ideas of natural selection. It actually did take him about 20 years for him to uh, come up with all of that information and publish it and make it known. In fact, he was even going to have his wife publish it upon his death because he knew that the information he was coming up with would be quite controversial since at the beginning of our lecture we said that uh, most ideas at the time were that species were fixed and that they were perfect, that they were unchanging.
so he was pretty reluctant at first. But with continual studies and some help with uh, some other scientists along the way, and especially with uh, ideas about selective breeding or also called artificial selection, he was able to come up with his ideas and publish them. Going to artificial selection, uh, at the time in England, breeds of dogs were kind of the craze. Even the queen herself was into dogs. And uh, so he saw how humans could choose traits and come up with new breeds. And he thought, well, couldn't nature do the same? Different forces acting. Couldn't that cause changes in species just like humans cause changes in the species of dogs? So back to the finches thinking in terms of natural selection, first you start with the variation or the differences in the beaks that allowed some finches to successfully compete and, and feed and reproduce and pass on those successful traits to their offspring. And then we would see those traits carried on that continued to be successful. In fact, there's a pair of famous scientists Rosemary and Peter Grant, who since the 1970s have been traveling to the Galapagos Islands and have been studying the finches. And uh, because it's such an isolated area, kind of a natural laboratory, they've been able to get to know the finches very well and uh, measure their beak depths and their beak lengths and have a lot of data and watch the changes in the populations over time. If you ever get a chance, the book is called The Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner, and it illustrates all of Rosemary and Peter Grant's data, where uh, Darwin thought evolution couldn't be seen in a lifetime of a human, that it takes so much longer. We're actually able to see evolution happening within seasons on the Galapagos Islands and elsewhere. So Darwin's ideas state this, that uh, just like artificial selection, nature can cause changes in organisms as well. So he termed it natural selection and states that organisms that are best adapted to their environment will indeed survive and reproduce. Um, we usually use the word evolution when we think of that, but actually Darwin did not use the word evolution. I think he used it only about like the word evolve once in his book, in his uh, published book that he wrote. Instead, he used the term descent with modification, meaning that the unity of all life is due to descent from a common ancestor that lived in the past. And as descendants of this common ancestor lived in various environments that even may have changed as the earth changed, they accumulated modifications, which we call adaptations, which are beneficial traits that fit them or made them more fit for their environment. With natural selection, it really is all about survival and then reproduction to be able to pass those traits on to your offspring. So these ideas um, came to Darwin and he uh, kind of was forced in a way to get his ideas out there. He really didn't want his ideas to just go away or die. He, he wanted people to know them. Um, it turns out that he got the push that he needed. Um, uh, another scientist at the time who was younger named Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858 had been working in the East Indies and had actually come up with the same ideas as Darwin. He may not have called it natural selection but the ideas were about the same and had written a paper and had heard that Darwin had kind of the same information and had sent it to him to ask him to review it before he passes it along for publication and 
you can imagine Darwin thinking at the time, man, these are my ideas. Now this guy is going to get all the credit for it. So um, actual, actually, we go back to Lyell, who I had said was um, kind of an influence in Darwin, in his scientific findings. Lyell actually took both papers and presented them to the English Society at the time of scientists. And uh, they actually decided to give the credit to Darwin since his idea um, came first and because his information and evidence was much more complete than Alfred Russell Wallace's information. The time was right for the idea. To Lyell, he wrote, Your words have come true with a vengeance. I never saw a more striking coincidence. So all my originality, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed. Hmm. And so Darwin published and wrote the book the, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Remember, this is 1859, his voyage had taken place in the 1830s. So we're talking quite a bit later. But nevertheless, did publish the ideas. Um, one of the bits of information that he was missing at the time that we do know about today is that he didn't know where the variations in organisms came from. He didn't know about DNA yet. Um, there was another scientist named Gregor Mendel at the time who will get to his chapters a little bit later in the course, but he was doing some of the first information on genetics. Had the two gotten together, it would have explained a lot because evolution is really termed as a change in the frequency of an allele in a population over time or a change in the frequency of genes in a population over time. Darwin didn't know about genes yet. Mendel was doing his work at the time and would publish a little bit later but would be ignored because Darwin's paper was kind of causing an uproar at the time. But as I said, if they had gotten together, had coffee maybe, then maybe uh, things would have made more sense right away. All right, so the essence of Darwin's ideas are here. So for natural selection to work, first you have variation that exists in a population. Variations are differences among organisms. Just like humans have variations in things like skin color and eye color. And then don't forget about the variations that exist inside of us, like the proteins on our cell membranes, um, the antibodies that we make with our immune systems. That's all variation. Some things we can outwardly see, some things are hidden in the chemistry of our bodies. The next thing is that there's an overproduction of offspring, that organisms actually have more offspring than an environment can support. And uh, if you ever uh, want to see that, look at, look at the amount of seeds that a plant will create, like a, a pepper plant makes so many seeds. And if, if all of those seeds were to survive generation after generation, then in within like six or seven years, they would overpopulate the world. Uh, luckily, not all the pepper seeds do survive, only a few do, to go on to the next generation. Next, there's competition for foods, mates, nesting sites, uh, escaping of predators. And uh, so with that competition, there's differential survival or different success rates at which organisms survive. They have different adaptations that allow them to survive better than others. And therefore differential reproduction that uh, the adaptations become more common in a population if it's a good adaptation for the environment. If you have good adaptations, I always say, then you're going to be able to survive and reproduce and pass those adaptations on to your offspring. These are some of the most important ideas that uh, 
come with Darwin's idea of natural selection. Also, I'd like to dispel the old saying, survival of the fittest, because there's a lot of um, wrong things that people can think about that. Sometimes when we think of fitness, we think of the biggest and the strongest, when in fact, sometimes being the biggest could get you killed. Um, when we think of fitness in terms of evolution, it's the types of adaptations you have and it's measured by how many offspring you're able to leave behind that you actually survive to reproduce in that environment. Next, let's take a look at, or a deeper look at the evidence that supports evolution. Generally, we divide it into these four areas. The fossil record, the anatomical record, also known as comparative anatomy, where we compare um, certain structures to one another, both in adult organisms and in developing organisms called embryos. We look at the molecular record, which is our DNA and our proteins, and then also compare that to something we just talked about, artificial selection. First of all, like the chapter said at the beginning, we have the, the layers of the earth that tell us a story that contain the fossils that can show us what was once alive and what isn't anymore. In sedimentary rock, the rock is laid down each year and an organism that dies stays within that layer of rock if they're covered up soon enough after death and if water is available and just the right conditions where the minerals in the rocks can replace the minerals in the bones then we get a fossil and not all things are lucky enough to be fossilized unfortunately but we do have a record of fossils that show us what once lived with the fossil record, we remember that things that are, are deeper in the Earth's strata, that uh, those things are older, and things that are not as deep, those things are newer, so we have kind of a, a record over time. It's kind of neat as you stand in places like the Grand Canyon, and water has carved out the rock, and you can actually see how the earth is layered, how those layers are laid down each year. That's called strati stratigraphy. Here's some cool pictures of some fossils from plant leaf impressions to actual bones and insects and arthropods found within amber that have been preserved and hominid or ancient human fossils. with Darwin's ideas, again, there would be an ancestral species that would give rise to other species. So we can see many different charts, like this one. This is a phylogenetic tree taken from finding fossils of these related organisms and placing them from oldest to newest, like we see here to we get to our African and Asian elephants, the mammoths and mastodons that are now extinct. But indeed, we did find them in North America. What a place that would be today if we had mammoths and mastodons roaming through Minnesota. And here's the ancestral species down here. So, from finding fossils, we're able to construct trees like this. Phylogenetic trees, also sometimes called cladograms. Here's one for horses. And if you look, if you, if you line up the fossils from oldest to newest, you can actually see 
the gradual change that occurred in them, such as in the foot of the ancient ancestor of the horse to the foot of the one that we know today. If a uh, species ends right here, like below the today mark, that means that they are indeed extinct. The evolution of birds finding the Archaeopteryx fossil in the fossil record that lived 150 million years ago that can um, surprisingly link reptiles and birds. One thing we commonly look for in the fossil record are what are called transitional fossils. Fossils that show the transition from one species to the next. Sometimes also called the missing link, like this one here, the titilic. The missing link from sea to land animals here. The discovery from 2006. Our next area is looking at the anatomical record at something called homologous structures. These are similarities and characteristics resulting from common ancestry, such as a common ancestor that had a certain limb, like we have today, that had the, the bones like we have. Um, this is our, our humerus, our radius and ulna and then our metacarpals, and then our phalanges, or also called digits. So that ancestral organism had those bones, though they didn't look like this. And as the organism changed over time and new species arose, those bones changed due to genetic differences, genetic mutations. And today we see organisms who have, again, all the same bones. If you take a look across, they all have a humerus. They all have a radius and an ulna. They all have metacarpals. And they all have phalanges or digits. But they look very different, but uh, very well suited to the life of the organism. Common ancestor giving rise to all of these structures that we now share at least similarly. Showing a close evolutionary relationship. Even leaves are said to have homologous structures. Leaves come in many different forms and shapes, from spines and needles to the familiar maple leaf here to the poinsettia leaves there that are colored, the succulent leaves like this one. Those are all homologous from a common ancestor plant very long ago. This is not to be uh, mistaken for what are called analogous structures such as probably the best example is the evolution of the wing. Now birds and insects, we know both have wings, but um, their common ancestor was much, much, much longer ago to be called a homologous structure. That's a separate case or a separate evolution of structures. Like this says here, solving a similar problem with similar solution. This is also an example of, of what's called convergent evolution. Analogous structures result from convergent evolution. Flight actually evolved in three separate animal groups, even in mammals and birds and insects. But their common ancestor, once again, way, way, way back, so far back that uh, you wouldn't say that um, their wings evolved from just one common ancestor. It was separate evolution 
So like the penguin says here, does this mean they have a recent common ancestor? No, it was much further back. Even organisms like uh, those that are in the sea. You know, dolphins, fish, sharks, all look very similar. Again, fish and dolphins, whales look very similar, but again, it's an example of convergent evolution or analogous structures. Their common ancestor was too far back to have evolved those structures from the same organism. Convergent evolution happens from having common niche, niches even if you are a continent away from one another. In Australia, North America, there's a common habitat that uh, a flying squirrel evolved in North America and a sugar glider in Australia, but again, it's convergent evolution. We would call those, again, analogous structures. More information with comparative anatomy uh, comes with vestigial organs or vestigial structures. Those are structures that organisms have, but they don't really use th those structures, or they don't function as well, or they don't use them at all. It's like remnants of structures that uh, ancestral organisms used, and uh, genetic mutations have over time changed those structures to uh, make them less useful or uh, not useful at all, but they haven't quite totally gone away yet. So you might see some remnants left. You need some more time and some more mutations for them to totally disappear, such as uh, the remains of pelvis and leg bones in snakes and whales that would have come from their walking ancestors, the eyes on the blind cave fish, the human tailbone, not too much use with that anymore. That's remnants of what was once a tail in our common ancestors. Hasn't gone away yet. Our appendix can also be called a vestigial or organ. There's, uh, it's limited use and we can even live without it if we remove it. The hind leg bones on whales Interestingly enough, a mammal that ended up living in the ocean and mutations took away these hind leg bones. Looking at uh, comparative embryology, our embryos kind of tell a story. In the beginning, we have similar structures, such as a tail. Well, even if you're a human, you have the beginnings of a tail. Little gill slits. Luckily, in humans, those don't actually turn into gills. And uh, these pharyngeal pouches on the sides as well. Sometimes it's so hard even to look at an embryo and tell what it is until later in its development. There's been a lot of study with the DNA of embryos lately showing that there are similar genes involved and sometimes even the same genes involved in these structures, but we found that there's other genes that act as switches that can kind of boss other genes around and turn them off or turn them on or give them limited time to function. If you take in a look in our book on page 252, they talk about some master genes called HOX, H-O-X genes, which sculpt details of a body's form during embryonic development. That the pattern of the expression of those genes determines the identity of particular zones along the body axis. 
um, insects and other arthropods have 10 Hox genes. One of them um, that determines the identity of the thorax, the part which has the legs, and then legs develop whether that gene is expressed in an embryo. And vertebrates have four sets of the same 10 Hox genes that occur in insects. A vertebrate version of the gene determines the identity of the back as opposed to the neck or the tail. Expression of the gene causes ribs to develop on a vertebrate. And vertebrae of the neck and tail normally develop with, with uh, no Hox C6 expression and no ribs. Hox genes also regulate limb formation, body appendages as diverse as crab legs, beetle legs, sea star arms, butterfly wings, fish fins, and mouse feet start out as clusters of cells that bud from the surface of the embryo. And the buds form wherever the uh, homeotic gene DLX is expressed. DLX encodes a transcription factor that signals clusters clusters of embryonic cells to stick out from the body and give rise to an appendage. Hox genes suppress the DLX expression in all parts of an embryo that will not have appendages. Interesting. Another area of evolution evidence is the molecular record or the record that DNA and proteins provide for us. We can compare DNA and protein structures. Uh, what we found is there's kind of a universal genetic code that uh, we can use to trace common ancestors with and, and build, here's another cladogram down here, or a phylogenetic tree. So by, uh, for instance, cytochrome C here, taking a look at that gene which is involved in cell respiration or the making of ATP or a gene for hemoglobin. We can compare sequences for that protein. We find closely related species have sequences that are more similar than the distantly related species. It kind of serves as what's called a molecular clock to see how long ago a species diverged from a common ancestor. Here's a chart on comparative hemoglobin structure. We remember from our earlier chapters that uh, proteins are chains of amino acids. And so hemoglobin, being a protein, is made out of chains of amino acids. So we take a look at the chains of those amino acids in these different organisms. And we compare the similarities and differences and we can see who has the most differences here from a human. The macaque monkey has only eight differences in the chain. Dogs, 32, birds, 45, frogs, 67, and then the sea lamprey way down here at 125 differences. Hence, that organism would be the oldest there compared to the rest of them, or the, the least related we diverged from that organism longer ago than the others. And from there we can build family trees, like here's another phylogenetic tree with um, primates. And Darwin did have this, this way of thinking, it was called tree thinking, which we use today in our phylogenetic trees. This is an actual excerpt from his journal where he wrote up here, I think, and then he drew out a tree with number one being a common ancestor of all living things. Again, artificial selection is used as evidence for evolution. The fact that humans can artificially select for the traits that they want in organisms like dogs and plants shows us that nature can do the same thing. Other evidence and sometimes scary things such as um, insects 
becoming resistant to our insecticides, bacteria becoming resistant to our antibiotics, and viruses changing so that we have to have new flu shots every year. If uh, there's variations in organisms and someone survives to pass on a variation that allows them to be uh, in resistant to the chemicals or drugs that we put on them, oops, then they could give rise to a whole new generation that are also resistant. It's kind of scary when you think about it. All of the drugs that we use for HIV could possibly um, not work anymore to help uh, keep the virus at bay. New drugs have to uh, continually be made, created. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's a good saying. Evolution is so overwhelmingly established that it has become irrational to call it a theory from Ernest Mayer. But remember, the uh, definition of a theory is a huge body of information that has so much evidence that backs it up and really does stand the test of time. There may be little parts where we find new evidence and new discoveries, especially with our new technologies, but usually it's not enough to throw out the whole body of information, but to tweak little bits of it as we refine the theory over time. Remember, germ theory and cell theory, those are theories as well. And those are very important to the area of biology, just like evolution is important to the area of biology. A uh, last area to look at is, again, back to, to looking at the Earth and the changes that happen with the Earth. I want to make sure you understand uh, some of the terms here that are also in the book, such as the term Pangea, how we've been able to track the changes of the continents and, and see that uh, continents are actually floating on the mantle of the Earth and are continually moving. That's called continental drift and uh, continents started apart, came together into a supercontinent called Pangaea, which was about 237 million years ago. That's also a time when the big dinosaurs existed and then broke up about 152 million years ago. And we can see today by tracing the outline of the continents where they actually did fit together. It's remarkable. Your book also talks about some of the other um, ways that the continents had fit together, that there's an older supercontinent named Gondwana that included these areas here that existed before Pangaea 500 million years ago. And your book also talks about when continents broke up, some of the time periods. These areas here again with the Pangaea Triassic, J Jurassic, and Cretaceous, those are times when dinosaurs existed on the Earth. And uh, because there was a uh, supercontinent, they were able to walk from one continent to the next. And that's why we find fossils kind of spread out like that, like on the coast of Australia and the coast of the nearby continent. Well, when all those continents were together, organisms were able to walk from wherever they wanted to go. When we find those fossils, we can use radiometric dating. Remember in previous chapters, we looked at what actually makes up an atom. The atom has a nucleus and it has protons and neutrons inside the nucleus and electrons going around the nucleus and gather up a bunch of those atoms together and you have the element 
of those atoms, we can take a look at the elements in the Earth's rocks and, and fossils and date them as to when they existed. As uh, those elements or atoms decay, they change into new atoms or elements. And we can do a ratio called the half-life, which is a characteristic time it takes for half of a quantity of a radioisotope to decay. And then we can uh, get an estimate of the age of the rock or the fossil by measuring the content and proportions of a radioisotope and its daughter elements that it leaves behind. That's called radiometric dating. Uh, uranium is a common one that we do that with decays into thorium and other elements until it becomes lead. So looking at a, that proportion, uh, we can get uh, 4.5 billion years on that one. We can also use carbon, um, but it's not as long. We can only date things to about 5,300 or so years with that, with carbon-14. Remember, carbon is the important atom that makes up all living things because of the four bonds that it can make. So this is a useful one in taking a look at when organisms died, as long as it's uh, within that five or 6,000 year time frame. So organisms like the Iceman, you know about that, uh, we can date with carbon dating. We can put time into perspective here. Transitions in the fossil record are boundaries for great intervals in the geologic time scale, which is the chronology of Earth's history, correlating geologic and evolutionary events. Our chapter leaves us with the closing statement on the KT boundary, once again, that layer of the Earth which formed 65 million years ago. It's rich in iridium, which actually is pretty rare on Earth's surface, but very common in asteroids. So when that asteroid hit 65 million years ago, a cloud of dust, imagine that coming up from the iridium and then settling on, or com coming up from the asteroid and then settling on the Earth's surface in that layer of strata for us to be able to see that today and then leaving that huge, huge crater in the Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. They say it's so big, it's uh, 170 miles across and about a kilometer deep. Um, at first, uh, no one even realized it was a crater, but today we do know it is, indeed. The crater is evidence of an asteroid impact 40 million times more powerful than the one that made the Beringer Crater and certainly would be big enough to influence life on Earth in a huge, huge way. Again, make sure you take a look at the end of the chapter. The uh, self-quiz and the critical thinking questions and the summary, starting on page 254 and going on to page 255.